Hi everyone. Today we'll be talking about some of the PACER's favorite conditions. Um, I've tried to break them down into different categories of conditions. So today we'll be talking about some of the hereditary disorders. Mm. So the purpose of today's session is really not to teach um, a lot of content about these conditions, but once again to provide a framework and perspective of how they come up in the PACES exam so that one would be able to, um, number one, tailor one studying according to the needs of the exam. And I think number two, uh, knowing when to think about these things uh, when there is an indication to. So the conditions we'll be talking about are number one, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, number two, retinitis pigmentosa, number three, hereditary angioedema, number four, acute intermittent porphyria, and number five, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, conditions one and two tend to come out more for station five uh, because they do have um, fairly florid signs. Um, three and four traditionally may be a um, station two uh, where one takes a uh, longer history and some of these differentials uh, are important to consider. And osteogenesis imperfecta can occasionally come out for station five um, although this is uh, based on my understanding uh, less common. So let's talk about hereditary uh, hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Before we go into the details, um, basically this is someone who uh, has a predisposition uh, because of a genetic disorder to form uh, angiodysplasias uh, in various organs. So primarily they manifest with bleeding, uh, bleeding in various sites. So epistaxis is one of the cardinal features uh, as demonstrated uh, by an independent point in the consensus criteria, um, but one can also have bleeding from other sites. So in the station five exam, this can come out as an approach to gastrointestinal bleeding, um, hemoptysis, uh, possibly even someone who comes in with a stroke that is hemorrhagic in nature. Uh, so in general, this is uh, some general information. This is an autosomal dominant disorder, hence the family history is important to ask. Uh, the onset also um, tends to be in the younger days. Clinical features are as described. Uh, and the consensus criteria, the Kurakao criteria comprises spontaneous recurrent epistaxis, multiple mucanus, mucocutaneous telangiectasias, which we'll see later on, uh, visceral involvement, so this can be systemic bleeding from the respective sites, as well as a family history of a first degree rel relative with the same condition. Complications uh, include heart failure, portal hypertension, uh, which is due to the hyperdynamic consequences of large angiodysplasias uh, and abscesses if they get infected. Treatment-wise, non-pharmacological is normally at the localized level, uh, in particular for epistaxis. Um, pharmacological agents uh, include uh, tamoxifen, uh, tranexamic acid, uh, as well as uh, anti-VEGF agents. Uh, and uh, it's also important to deal with complications of iron deficiency anemia and interventions that are organ targeted. So these are uh, some images that were uh, obtained from a Google image search. It's important to look out at, to look and examine carefully at the sites where the telangiectasias can be found. So as you can see them on the fingertips and the oral mucosa around the lips, uh, as well as on the tongue. So these are areas to uh, carefully examine uh, and once again, these are probably signs that you will not pick up if you don't uh, hunt for it. So anyone who has a bleeding complication or manifestation as a presenting complaint, this is a condition to think about. Next is retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa tends to come out in the station 5 uh, scenario. And um, usually the approach is fairly straightforward. It's someone who comes in with uh, visual problems. Um, so. It's one of those conditions that we don't see very commonly in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, but for the purposes of the exam, if it's a condition that one adequately prepares for, uh, it's one uh, station that one can do pretty well at. So inheritance-wise, it's autosomal dominant. So once again, with all the hereditary disorders, a family history is very important. Uh, but there are also uh, variable uh, patterns of inheritance. So it's not always AD. Um, clinical features, primarily in terms of the visual loss history, tends to be first affecting peripheral vision and night vision uh, before the rest of the vision gets compromised. Uh, family history is also important, as mentioned. And then we talk about other associated features, and this uh, ties in with the associated uh, eponymous syndromes. Uh, so 
unfortunately for, for these eponymous syndromes, uh, one probably just has to commit it to memory. Uh, but I find asking uh, things that can be elicited easily in history would be any un gait unsteadiness for cerebellar syndromes, uh, as well as any hearing disorders. So um, just take some time to commit the various uh, eponymous syndromes to memory, uh, as well as knowing their associated uh, complications. Treatment-wise is generally supportive uh, with genetic counseling, given that it's a genetic disorder. Um, yeah, so it is important to know the cardinal features uh, in, on, an, uh, on a fundoscopy. So they are uh, bone spicules, Arteriolar attenuation as well as optic disc pallor, which we see here, the bone spicules, the arteriolar attenuation as well as the optic disc pallor. The next condition is hereditary angioedema. Um, based on uh, my experience, this is something that comes out more commonly in the long case history taking, um, primarily because oftentimes patients don't have uh, that uh, florid signs to pick up. So hereditary angioedema is a condition due to deficiency or dysfunction of uh, C1 inhibitor. It's autosomal do dominant uh, inheritance, and the swelling is uh, bradykinin-mediated. Why this is important is because for uh, bradykinin-mediated uh, swelling disorders, um, such as in this case, uh, the, um, they, they don't tend to respond very well to uh, antihistamines. So apart from the classic angioedema in terms of eye swelling, mouth, tongue swelling, they can also get symptoms affecting the respiratory upper airways, uh, the uh, bowels as well. And uh, they don't typically have hives or pruritus as what you tend to normally see in a histamine-driven process such as uh, um, uh, anaphylaxis or someone with uh, getting an allergic reaction. Uh, some of the triggers include trauma, dental work, ACE inhibitors, stress. Investigations-wise, you'll be looking out for a low C4, and one can check the uh, C1 and H protein levels, and function, and genetic testing. Uh, Treatment-wise is uh, C1 and H concentrate, C1 inhibitor concentrate, uh, or bradykinin 2, beta 2 receptor antagonists. Uh, yeah. So oftentimes, the discussion will encircle around differentials. So important differentials to consider would be medication-related uh, angioedema, such as due to ACE inhibitors, in, uh, as well as uh, other uh, allergic reactions that may also cause, uh, for example, angioedema or bilateral eye swelling. The next condition is uh, acute intermittent porphyria. Uh, I think the important thing to, to consider is that, uh, once again, this condition tends to be more a long case history taking uh, condition uh, because once again of the lack of very uh, obvious uh, signs. Um, in these patients, they, they normally have a couple of main symptoms. Number one, gastrointestinal symptoms. They tend to have uh, very severe uh, abdominal pains. Um, they also can get neurological symptoms and of note, they can get dark urine. Um, so going back to differentials and approaches, uh, acute intermittent porphyria is in my approach to abdominal pain. Uh, someone who gets episodic abdominal pain in the presence of dark urine, uh, apart from biliary disease, uh, hematuria, uh, from stones, acute intermittent porphyria is something to think about when there is a constellation of these features. Um, investigations are mainly the urinary uh, porphobilinogen, uh, second line investigations, um, you can read around them. And management primarily is that of IV, hemin, analgesia, and uh, avoidance of triggers. So the last condition is uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, to my understanding, this is not a very common uh, case that comes out in PACES, but once again, it's something, something worthwhile preparing because we don't see it that commonly in our day to day practice. It's commonly autosomal dominance, so family history is important with features and um, problems starting in early childhood. It's mainly a pediatric disease. Uh, but also, Genesis Imperfecta is a spectrum in terms of its severity uh, based on different types. Um, they tend to get bony problems in the form of uh, multiple, minimally, or atraumatic fractures. And uh, other classical features would include that of uh, bony dysplasias, blue sclera, hearing disorders uh, because of uh, autosclerosis. Um, they also get um, teeth discoloration and uh, easy bruisability. 
So the management and is primarily supportive and investigations wise, uh, it's mainly genetic testing as well as a possibly a supportive skin biopsy. So these are features uh, once again taken off the internet, the blue sclera that you see here, the deformed teeth, as well as the bony deformities uh, that's described. Yep, so um, I hope that you found this uh, quick sharing useful and uh, all the best.